Yeah. 
Sports Community Foot Washing Services, but also I'm very thankful that uh, one day what we just sang about will be a reality for us. That one eternal day to be able to worship God with His feet. Um, do want to remember all those that stand in need this morning, uh, those that are uh, sick. Uh, I'm going to mention my mom. I've been feeling good last little bit. Um, also, do want to mention, um, unfortunately, uh, back at our home county, my brother Stacy, uh, they celebrated their graduation uh, Friday, but unfortunately, it was uh, minus one uh, graduate lost his life the night before in a tragic accident. Um, and the young lady that was with him in the car accident, I think you heard anything new about her? I haven't heard anything new. I know that she was critical condition. Uh, critical condition and I think the most recent thing was she was able to try to determine whether or not they were going to be able to save her legs. Uh, and which tragedy in itself, but uh, I understand that she's also had a scholarship to play soccer uh, that she was getting ready to uh, take part in. So uh, again, just remember those families have been affected by that and then also pray for all those that were able to walk across the stage and get their diploma and start that new chapter of their life so uh, we we'll to remember that um, also we do want to mention uh, I understand that uh, Sister Georgie's son-in-law Phillip's not doing very well uh, I think they sent him home and I don't think they get from what I gather they sent him home not because he was improving but uh, I think kind of the opposite that they've done everything that they could for them at this point. So, um, they didn't mention hospice, but I took it as that, like I said, he wasn't, wasn't doing very well at all. So, uh, we do want to remember that uh, in our prayers uh, this morning. Is there any other that we need to be uh, mindful of uh, this morning? You know, prayer requests. And then remember uh, uh, Campbell family. Remember, remember that. Uh, Leslie lost her dad uh, a couple weeks ago and do want to remember that uh, in our prayers. Um, also another family, uh, Robin's family, and that Robin's passed away uh, just prior to that. Um, it seems like we have another one. Elder Mary, you want to talk to your son? Uh, my son Howard has started his final round of chemo last Friday. The, the surgery is not an option anymore. This is the final stage. And uh, it's a prayer for him that he'll be comforted. And we talked about, he and I had a discussion about life and death and life hereafter. And he's at peace with it. So that is a good thing. Amen. The Lord blesses us in moments like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Remember that. Um, I knew there was another one. Uh, Brother Jeff Jackson just got baptized uh, last month. He had a surgery. He had a, a mass that they had to remove close to his uh, heart. Uh, and, and they were able to remove that, remove it successfully. I think they're doing a biopsy of it to see if it, it's going to turn out whether or not it's cancerous. But uh, um, talked to his dad. His dad was baptized with him. Uh, said that he, everything. They did everything in the surgery that they needed to. We did have to have open heart surgery to remove that, unfortunately. But uh, so he is, we'll be recovering from that. But uh, again, remember him as he recovers uh, from that surgery. Uh, anyone else? Anything else we need to be mindful of this morning as we go forward in prayer? Brother Cody, remember my remember my sister in prayer, and yeah. also remember uh, um, Alan's family, and also I also remember my hand and for her. We lost her after my uncle passed away. Remember, remember that. Remember that. Remember my family members. Anyone else before we? Go to the, um, like I mentioned, like that. Thank, <coughs> thank the Lord for uh, Brother Carl's uh, good news from last week. And he said you told us that uh, you got a good report on your. Yeah. It says I'm cancer free right now. Amen. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, anyone anyone else? I have a co-worker that married her to me. She's a 19 year old girl. And uh, she's suffering from a heart death. Mm -hmm. It's critical. And she's trying to get help. But she's not able to get anywhere yet. She's on a wait list. Mm -hmm. um, I'm scared for her really <laughs> as far as her life. But just want to take it. Remember that. 
Anyone else before we go to the Lord in prayer? And as always, remember our nation, remember our men and women, brother Stacy's son in the military. Uh, I've got a nephew who just graduated. He'll be going, I think, uh, I can't remember if it's June or July. He'll be shipping out to start his uh, basic training. So uh, remember, remember him. Um, remember any uh, any of our military, law enforcement, uh, first responders. They again, they've got a hard, hard job uh, right now, especially. So uh, remember that. Uh, anyone else before we go to word of prayer? Uh, I'm going to leave us in a word of prayer uh, this morning, and we're going to ask Brother Rick uh, come and speak. And after that, Brother Conley uh, uh, come after that. Just, um, I'm not going to say divide up the time. I don't want anybody looking at the watches as far as that goes. But the clock's not right. <laughs> like I see there, you got watches. Yeah, pay attention to that clock. That, that's the one you go by then. Uh, but then after that, we'll close out, uh, and we'll go into our, our communion and our foot washing services at that time. So, um, not anything else feel about with me. Lord, we'll Lord, pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we bow before thy feet, dear Lord, we just pray that we come before thee so grateful and thankful, Heavenly Father. Knowing and believing that thou art God, and besides thee, there is none other, Heavenly Father. Knowing and believing, Heavenly Father, that the words of, the, of thy scriptures, Heavenly Father, is truth, Heavenly Master. That gives us all that we need to, uh, in, to know in the way to walk it according to thy statutes uh, in, in order to uh, seek out that straight and narrow path, Heavenly Father. To let our light shine before thee, so that, before men, so that uh, they may see our good works and glorify thee. And here we pray, Heavenly Father, for this little church and the communion service that we will soon take part in, Heavenly Father. We just pray, dear Lord, that thou would uh, uh, come into our midst, Heavenly Father. Sit down and sup with us just for a short time. Uh, dear Lord, that we may uh, go out of this little place rejoicing, Heavenly Father. Uh, and we pray, Heavenly Father, dear Lord, that we just, uh, that Thou uh, see fit to watch over this nation, Heavenly Father. Uh, dear Lord, we fear that it's come to a place, Heavenly Father, that's went so far away from Thee, Heavenly Father, that uh, so many has uh, turned their backs, not only turned their backs uh, on Thee, Heavenly Father, but refused to let uh, anyone around them acknowledge uh, the and the Holy Word, Heavenly Father. We just pray that we continue to stand on that firm foundation, dear Lord. Uh, continue to uh, boldly profess the Word of God and, and our belief, the Heavenly Father. Not only our belief in Thee, dear Lord, but our belief that for some reason, Heavenly Father, Thou would seem fit to do something uh, for us that we could not do for ourselves. And then, Lord, we just ask, Heavenly Father, knowing and believing that Thou art all powerful, and then can stay Thy precious hand, dear Lord. We pray for those that are dealing with sickness, Heavenly Father. Uh, dear Lord, uh, the uh, young lady that Sister Leslie mentioned, that uh, Heavenly Father and uh, broke Conley Son, dear Lord, we uh, just know, Heavenly Father, that Thou art able uh, to, uh, to heal, Heavenly Father, uh, to remove any sickness and any, uh, any uh, issue uh, from us, Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, we pray that if it be according to Thy holy and precious will that Thou would do that very thing. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Brother Jeff as he recovers from his surgery, Heavenly Father. Uh, dear Lord, again, we just pray for all those that did uh, Brother Carl's uh, uh, positive report, Heavenly Father. We know, dear Lord, that we give the uh, praise and honor to Thee for all that Thou has done for us in, in these things. Heavenly Father, we pray, dear Lord, that, again, that Thou would continue to watch over this nation, continue to watch over all those that are serving on foreign souls, and there are those that are serving here at home, dear Lord. We just pray for each and every one, a hand of protection upon them. Lord, we pray for uh, these elders. They will soon stand before us, Heavenly Father. Lift them up above the cares of this world. Give them the liberty of their calling, Heavenly Father. They may expound upon that holy word uh, for a short time. These favors are humbly made in the name of Christ Jesus for thy sake. And amen. Amen. <laughs> Good to be here this morning. Always enjoy the times that we've been blessed to come. Sometimes when we are called upon, we may feel a little empty. Sometimes we call upon, we may 
feel full. But we know that either in the times of emptiness or in the times of fullness, that it's God who that we've come to worship. And in the times of emptiness, that I trust we take away more with us than what we brought. And in times of fullness, that I trust that we take more with us than what we brought. We live in an age and time. I, I do beg an interest of your prayers. I know the brother said not to be mindful of the clock, but I'm going to try to be. There's one thing I love to do, Brother Conway, it's to preach God's Word. If He blesses us to do so. If He doesn't bless us, then our words are futile. And we just take up time and take up space. It's wonderful to know that when God is amongst our presence, how time seems to be just as a vapor. If he's not there, that's some of the longest times in our lives. It seems like it never passes by. And we live in days and in times that to us is probably the worst times of my life. Maybe the worst of your life. Brother Seth and Brother Avery's very young. They live to be older as some of us are. I don't say old anymore because I passed up what I thought was old many years ago. But we live to be older. But yet we live in that promise there's coming a day that we'll never age no more. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around that there will be a day that will not grow old. Never grow old, as one of the hymns says. But in my 61 years, I've seen a lot of changes in my life in this world. Brother Seth, Brother Avery, you're going to see a lot of changes. And it's not necessarily going to be for the good. And I've heard a lot of times that things that go on in this world, some of the generation that is older than I am would say, well, I wonder what my ancestors would say if they were living today. <clears throat> or I've heard many a times that they would say, well, I bet you so-and-so is turning over in her grave cause of the things that are going on today. One thing for certain is that time changes. Some say people change. Sometimes they do change for the good. But as far as the flesh, they don't change. They just manifest more and more each and every day of the nature that they possess. The nature that you and I possess. That is that we are sinners by nature. And thank God that we are what we are by His grace Amen. and His mercy. I was always raised to honor my mother and father to be obedient <clears throat> unto them. I wasn't always obedient. But I knew what would happen if I got caught. That still didn't prevent me from doing some of the things that I've done. You may do something and not get caught and you think, well, I'll try something else. You keep trying and you keep trying. Sooner or later, there's an old saying that if you're going to dance, sooner or later you'll pay the fiddler. In other words, you'll pay the price for that which you do. We might 
keep things hid from one another that we do in this life, things that we should be, if we're not ashamed of, we should be. But we'll never keep them hid from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do believe that we'll suffer in this body the things that we do which are contrary to God. We reap what we sow. Reap what we sow. Don't always so good. But we pay the price. And I think sometimes if you go back in history, and you begin to look how things have changed in this world. Now this country has only been around a little over 200 years that we know of as far as being populated. Although it was populated when Columbus first sailed the seas and landed up on the shores of the, what we call the United States. And you think back in the days and times when Columbus landed upon the shores. What were times like back then? We know that Indian tribes existed and were here. So they lived in days and times probably better than what we live today in many ways. Didn't have any drug problems back then. Don't know if I'm sure drugs existed in the sense, but maybe man had not yet discovered what drugs were or what the effects that they would have upon the human body and the human mind. They lived a simple life. Today, people live a very fast-paced life. And they're never satisfied with what they have. They always want more. The majority of people, not all people, but the majority of people always want more. Can you imagine how that the Indians felt when they refer to the white man that came and basically took over their land. Introduced new things amongst them. But yet I believe that even in that day and time the Indians trusted in a higher being. And they trusted and knew within their hearts and soul. Religion is not something that is, is new. It's something that has always been around. They may not have understood as you and I do. Some of the older generations may have not understood. Generations to come may understand more than you and I. Or they may understand less. That's something that we don't know. No one knows what tomorrow may hold. But they lived a simple life. They hunted the land, provided their own meat, raised their own corn, their own food. We may look at it as they had a pretty hard life. But in reality, I think they had a much simpler and easier life than we did. We make things complicated. Even though we have it easier, we make it complicated. And I wonder sometimes what they would think if they were living today. I remember growing up as a child and watching the cartoons. The Jetsons was one of my favorites. It was a day and time that we thought was far-fetched. People driving cars, not on the highways, but cars that flew. You pushed a button and you 
got pretty much anything you wanted. When you wanted supper, you just want to push the button. Now it popped. Piping hot. You went to the doctor, you stood at the front of this screen or in behind the screen, they pushed a button and you could see everything there was about the body. They'd be able to tell you what was wrong. This was back in the 60s and 70s and we thought, that's pretty far-fetched. A lot of that is reality today. You may say, well, we, we don't have flying cars. They have the technology. It's just not been introduced yet. We probably would have thought that flight in space was just a mere imagination. But yet, it's something that's come to pass. I grew up in a day and age when everybody thought the world was flat. They may still be some today that thinks the world is flat. But you see, our intellect has progressed. And we've come to know things that maybe generations before us didn't know. Maybe they thought things were far-fetched. Could you imagine going from riding a horse or walking wherever you went you know, our ancestors, when they settled in these lands, in the places that we live today, the only transportation they had was either by horse or walk. They didn't have a bicycle to hop on and go wherever. They didn't have a car or a truck to uh, get in and drive wherever they wanted to go. And you think about how that they went from the East Coast all the way to the West. Now, if you and I decided we was going to take a trip out West, we'd think it'd be pretty stupid for somebody to set out walking. Look, we'd probably think it was pretty be pretty stupid to uh, even imagine doing such a thing and, and set out walking in order to achieve that. We'd have to get out our there's no longer atlases or, or road maps, paper, where well, they probably are some around, but they're obsolete. We'd have to get our GPS and punch in where we want to go and where we were starting from in order to be able to go to wherever our destination is. They didn't have any of that back then. Today people think that we live in hard times. But we live in a lot easier times than what our ancestors lived in. Most of them didn't have a grocery store that you could go to, buy a can of beans or a sack of potatoes. But all they had was the basics. They buy flour and sugar, spices. But they grow their corn, they grow their potatoes, they grow their beans, they save the seeds thereof. People, I, I wonder today how many of the younger generation really understand where the vegetables come from. You may think, well, where is he going with this? I don't know at the moment where I'm going. Don't know where I might end up at. But I trust that the Lord will lead us along the way. We have conveniences of life. And all those conveniences, sometimes I think we fail to give God the honor and the glory. I had a college professor, and if I remember anything from college, and I'll never forget this. He said, no matter what you gain on the left hand, you're going to lose it on the right. Because it's got to balance out. Life has got to balance itself out. And you know, he's so true in that. In our work professions, we have 
means to where we don't have to work as hard manually now. Some people still do manual labor. But some of us said push a button. And we let the machines do it. Fill up work for us. We become, as a whole, a lazier society. Have Not only have we become lazier, but we become weaker. Well, instead of doing manual labor, which builds the body and the muscles and our strength and all, we usually sit and do nothing. I had a job where I sat and done nothing about the last 10 years of my work. Come week. Then depreciate the things that we have. You begin to make a little bit more money. You spend and spend and you have less. I remember when I started work in 1979, I made $5 and a quarter an hour. That was big money back then, Brother Kyle. Yeah. That was big money. That was a lot more than what my father started out making. You could go to the grocery store and you could uh, fill the trunk of your car up for 20 bucks. Maybe not get all the groceries in the car if you spent 20 bucks. Now you can carry it in one little old bag about half full. 20 bucks worth. You could buy gas for 35 cents a gallon. Now it's almost $3 a gallon around here. More than that in other places. Had a quarter allowance for school, for recess. I could buy a pot and a bag of chips and a candy bar and have a dime left over. So do we really have it made better today than we did years ago? Time changes. People change as times change. Their nature doesn't change. The more they have, the more they want. You've seen people like that. They're not happy with what they have. They always want more and are never satisfied. Truth of the matter is, we're never going to be satisfied here upon this side of heaven. Only time I'm ever satisfied is when I'm in the service of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The only time that I can truly express true joy is when I can feel the presence of my Lord and my Savior within my heart and within my soul. That's the times that I feel to be the richest among all people. What does Scripture tell us? It tells us that if we have food, and if we have brain, that we are to be therein content. How many of us, if all we had was food and rain, would we be content? We'd be fussing because we didn't have a nice automobile or a nice a bicycle or whatever it was. If we had to walk everywhere that we went, We'd be fussing, wouldn't we? Would you go to church if you had to walk today? If you didn't have an automobile to come to church, whether you lived a mile or 10 or 15 miles, would you make an effort to go out to church? 
I dare say that I probably would. I know my nature. Think about the generations of old when they didn't have the transportation. When it comes to meeting time, they were there. They made that effort to go to church and to worship the Lord. I can remember tales of the old elders in the winter months that they would ride their horses through the snow in the freezing rain. And when they would ride at wherever it was they were going, the brethren had to go and cry their legs loose from the saddle. Do you think they enjoyed church maybe more than you and I do? They didn't have the padded seats to sit on. Some of those old wooden benches was pretty hard. I remember <clears throat> sitting on several of them from time to time. But you know times were better back then. <clears throat> They wouldn't be empty seats within the church house. They'd all be full. Remember times that even the windows would be raised and they'd be lined up two and three or four deep on the outside. Because they had that desire to hear the good news about their Lord and Savior. They wanted to hear the songs of Zion being sung. You might say, well, if they got to church a little bit earlier, they wouldn't have had to stood outside. That wasn't the case either. I can recall being at church an hour before it ever started and the house was already full. You see, we have conveniences in life. And the more conveniences that we have, the less that we appreciate that that we should. Where would you be if you didn't have the Lord in your life? Could you be content? I don't believe a child of God could. Because their joy is to feel the presence of the Lord in their hearts and in their souls and in their beings. Oh, we make a great effort to attend the University of Tennessee or the University of Kentucky ball game. I remember when I was first working and I had access to UK's uh, tickets to their basketball team. And I might not know till four hours before the game if I was going to get the tickets or not. But I made every effort to be prepared in case those tickets become available. And I'd call my wife, tell her to find the babysitter and uh, she'd grab her makeup bag and put her makeup on while we were driving down the interstate. That doesn't mean anything to me anymore. I could care less. Could care less. What means more to you in life? It doesn't matter whether we have a nice fancy home to live in or whether we've got what others would look as just a little old shack. Doesn't matter if we have a fine automobile or if we're driving one uh, 20 years old. You see, they'll both get you to wherever you're going. Doesn't matter if we have a fancy clothes to wear. Most of the time, I don't wear a tie anymore. Don't find anywhere in the scriptures that it's required, Brother Conman. I believe we're to dress decently. Not only on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday as well. 
but we are to present these your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and unblameable and acceptable unto God. You might say the days of sacrifices are over. They've been fulfilled in the Old Covenant. And those sacrifices uh, they are fulfilled to a job and a till. No more is it required of us to take the life and the blood of an animal that uh, was a symbol, a type and a shadow of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Because when Christ came into this world, He was the ultimate sacrifice. Those sacrifices under the law of service could never uh, take away our sins. Uh, but it brought us into remembrance each and every uh, day, each and every uh, sacrifice that we stood in need of a cleansing from our sins. When Jesus Christ came into this world, He came to do the will of His Father. Amen. He came, child of grace, that He might redeem every hour of promise from under the law of sin and death. By one offering, the Bible says that He perfected forever them that are sanctified. I sometimes feel like that uh, maybe uh, we as God's children, we've got a little uh, passive in our service to the Lord. The world will look at us in the sense that if I believe the way the old Baptists believe, I live my life any way that I want to uh, because you're still forgiven of your sins. Why may I live my life like that when I was under the roof of my mother and father? Uh, but I face the consequences thereof. And I believe that once we've been born of the Spirit of God, uh, He takes away uh, that desire uh, that we would live our life any way that we want. That doesn't mean we don't yet sin. But we still have that very nature about us. But I believe that uh, the Spirit of God that dwells within us, uh, a child of grace, is greater uh, than that of the flesh. Amen. And that it should be our desire to walk in the way, to uh, walk in the truth and the light thereof. Uh, you might ask, what is the way? <laughs> uh, the Bible tells us that Christ is the way. He led by example when He was upon this earth. All we need to do is be as Christ. Uh, do the will of our Heavenly Father. Live in the straight and the narrow way. Be obedient unto Christ. Shun sin. Lay aside every weight which so easily uh, besets us. What do we have to offer today? I tell you, although Christ fulfilled the law, uh, yet He requires of us an offering each and every day. He said, as I quoted earlier, offer these your bodies a living sacrifice. He has no pleasure in a dead sacrifice. Uh, uh, it's the living sacrifice uh, uh, that can only please God. Uh, uh, their child of grace. Seek Him who is above. Uh, continue to do His will. Uh, you know, I, I love to hear these old uh, uh, songs of Zion, but I'll tell you something I don't like to hear. 
I don't like to hear God's children say, I, I don't have a voice to sing praises unto God. I, I, I don't want to ruin the singing because I, I don't have the voice to sing. I disagree with that statement there. I believe that God has given us the very instrument that we need to sing praises. It's not in musical instruments there. But every one of us possesses an instrument that God has given unto us there. And we're to blend together in a sweet song of joy and harmony there unto God. Be not ashamed of what God has given you. He's given us all a voice, a child of grace, to sing sweet praise to His holy name there. And if I don't use that voice, that don't mean I have to try to sing the loudest than any other. But I do believe that God has given us all a voice to sing His praises. And I'll tell you there's no sweeter sound than when the voices of the children of God blend together there as He blesses them to be able and to sing his song God, he'll bless your ears to hear use what God has given you be content with what God has given you don't worry about that you might have less than anybody else or that you might have more than anybody else as far as worldly possessions go when it comes to the service of God. We're all equal. We're all sinners saved by His grace. We've all been born of the Spirit of God. He doesn't love one of us uh, any more or any less than the other. He loves us all the same. And He proved that great love for Him that He loved us. You know, I, when I become a father, that was one of the proudest days in my life. And when my children got a little older and were able to talk, and they'd say, Dad, I love you. Now, that made me feel good. Felt ten foot tall. Little grandchildren come along, and there's a different love. Don't ask me to explain, but it's different. And you'll only explain experience it if you have grandchildren. You love them in a sense more than you do your own children. Not that you uh, dislike your children, but they become a little bit more special, those grandchildren do. And I remember my little granddaughter, one of them coming one day, and she said, Papa, she said, I love you this much. This month, it flooded my heart because I realized not only did she love me that much, I realized the God of heaven loved me that much. When he outstretched his arms on the cross of Calvary, gave his life a ransom for you and me, shed his precious blood, that we might be washed as white as the drippings of snow. How much do you love the Lord? Shouldn't you love Him this much? Shouldn't you be willing to lay down your life for Him? Now I'm not talking about death. 
we should love him enough that we're willing to lay down the life of the flesh, live a life in the light. Let our light so shine, as the Bible says, that others would see our good works and glorify our Father, which are in heaven. Times come and times change. Days come and days go. But one thing remains the same. God will never change. If he's ever loved you, he'll always love you. Amen. And he'll love you unto the end. And then there's coming a day that time is going to change such as we've never experienced. I'll leave you with that thought. Think upon that day. Time shall be no more as we know time. Be an everlasting day. And it's going to change for the best. It don't always change for the best in this life. But it'll change for the best in that day. And it'll never change again. God bless you. Is our prayer. Good morning to all of you. Hope you're doing real well this morning. Some of you don't know me, some of you probably remember me vaguely. My name is Con the Miracle. I used to be the elder at Bethlehem Church down in Dunlap. I was pastor there. And there's a little story about that I'm going to tell you. I usually don't tell any stories. I usually get right to it. But this pertains to Brother Ricky and what he was saying, and I want to mention that. I'd been to Dunlap Church that day. It's a 300 miles round trip. I was pastor there, and I went down, held service. They had a very good uh, service down there. and come back out the halls, and there was a good friend of mine, Harold Flynn. Uh, his wife was bedridden. And I would come by after church and stop out there at her house and read scripture to her and have prayer with her. I don't sing. I can sing a little bit as long as I got somebody else that's around me out and nobody hears me. But I sing anyway. Now, that day, for some reason or another, Harold Flynn decided he wanted to go to church. I said, let's go. So we went. We went to Knoxville Primitive Baptist Church. Elder Wilder was pastor there. And Paul Banks, uh, um, he, he, was, he was there too. And uh, it, no, it wasn't Paul Banks and Paul Adams. Paul Banks was over at Mossy Road Church. Anyway, I went in. Elder Ricky Dorton was holding, Dorton, he was holding the service that evening. Well, I knew it. And I was glad he was there. And he preached a message I still remember. And I mentioned to him outside. And I met him several times before that. But that's the last time I met him. And what he told us was that he had helped two funerals that week. Two of his cousins, I think he said. Now, if I get this wrong, it's not what I'm going to say anyway. He taught us a lesson that night, that Sunday evening, about the transformation between this life and the life to come. I still remember it. And I mentioned to you just a while ago uh, that my son, Howard, we already had our meeting about, he said, I don't know what heaven's like. And I told him, heaven is the home prepared for you after this life. At the end of this life, you have a transformation period. That's all death is. It's 
Death is the last thing you do in this life. That's it. You can't change that. That's set out in the Scriptures. God put that in down firm. You transform all His people transformed to this life to the life to come. We can't change that. Nobody else can change it. He put that down firm. Now, Elder Ricky Dorton taught this lesson to me at Smoky Mountain Church that Sunday night. Harold Flynn went with me. Very soon after that, I think it was the very next week, he had a massive heart attack out in his yard. He went to St. Mary's Hospital. Instead of going by and having a prayer and reading scripture to his wife, I went to the hospital and it also did it for him. He told the hospital I was his pastor. He'd never been to my church, but he told the hospital people, and I walked through the basement door and went to his room no matter what, and had prayer and read scripture to him. And I drew that strength a lot at Elder Ricky Dorton. Now, he didn't make it out of the hospital. He passed away in the hospital. The day after he passed away, his younger brother died with a heart attack. And they had met, the family met. And Harold Flynn transferred the messages in the scripture I'd read about this life and the life to come he transferred it to the family meetings they had while he was, before he passed away. Elder Ricky, I do a pay attention to what you say sometimes. I still remember that message. That's how powerful the Word of God could be to us from one to another. And how comforting it could be. We, we don't even know sometimes. I doubt the Elder Ricky even had any inkling at all about what the power of that message had on me in my life and yet to deal with my son dying of cancer. Or supposedly. We don't know if he died of cancer or not. We don't know that. We don't know what we got we're faced with. We live today. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. But message from your minister has effect on your life. This message may not, but another may. It may not have an effect on you, but does somebody else. We don't know, but we gain knowledge from what we learn from the teachings of our pastor and our ministers that stand in front of us. I'm saying we do. Me too. I learn a lot too. And this is very important. That, that's how we learn to live our daily lives and what we're expecting to do. Now, I'm going to hush on that. That wasn't what I was going to talk about. He's the one who called me to do that. <laughs> okay? Now, another thing I want to mention about Brother Ricky, he hadn't seen me in a long time, so I get to hound him a lot this morning. I might not see him for a while yet. But another thing he said that was real important, what you might not really expect from people, some of the things you won't expect anyway, is the power of the Word of God. And he said he was, and the things that we live in this life and what we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and everything, he talked about the good old days, way back in the good old days. Well, yeah, okay, uh, well, that's good. What he had to say was very good and everything. But uh, then he mentioned 61 years old. Well, that kind of rung a bell in my mind because wait till he's in his 85th year living and then, then we won't hear that message again. <laughs> That's me now, 85 years old. God has blessed me beyond measure. I have no health issues to speak of. Yeah, I'm 85 years old, but my son is in bad shape. He can't go out and hold He's still going and coming and everything, still working. But here's the situation. Where we live, we have, uh, me and him together have 10 acres of land. I got a John Deere tractor. I keep that mowed and bush hog and everything. I'm, like I said now, 85 years old. You remember that. Yeah. I remember some of the things you taught me. Now you remember what I'm saying. Now, uh, they got oh, they a dome back there, a little hill back there behind his log cabin. And his wife said he, she'd like to have a picnic area back there. And I said, well, I'll just build you a pavilion back there, a picnic pavilion. Well, it grew from a little bitty area to put a picnic table on to 
to 12 foot wide and 25 feet long with a roof over it and gravel with patio stone where the big dick table sit. Now can you imagine in your mind what a project that is for an 85 year old man to build with himself? Now I'm going to set up right these 12 6 by 6s or 4 by 6s, 12 foot high and get up there and put this roof on at 85 years old. Yeah, you got it right. I'm going to do it by myself. Now, that's another one for you, Mark. <laughs> okay? Now, I'm, that's our daily lives as we live today. Now, what I want to tell you about, I had a need of my son. We talked about heaven. And it's power of the scriptures that God left for us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, left for us. I was able to, without any children in dies or heartaches or anything, tell him what he could expect in life and death. Now, this is not the priest at some other organization of peoples that does things, and I've been to their gatherings and didn't understand the cotton-picking thing they said, that didn't know what they talking about. I hope you are different to me today. You understand what I'm saying. I didn't ask you to agree with everything I say. Just understand it. Okay, you might agree later and you might not. But now, this is what we talk about. What happens to you in your final hour of life? It has nothing to do with you living today. It might, it might not. It might have a lot to do with it. But now what's going to happen to you? You're going to breathe your last breath and you're going to leave this life and as soon as you die, before you die, if you remember what happened in the Bible, Christ is on the cross, he gave up the ghost and then he died. So did Stephen when he had been stoned. He gave up the ghost and then he died. That's what's going to happen to us. Me, you, and not everybody still breathing. That's what happened to everyone before us. The soul and the spirit go back to the Lord, and the earthen body goes back to the earth from which it came. That's what happens to us. We will be resurrected a glorified body. It, there is no gender in heaven. These are the things I taught my son from the scriptures. There is no gender in heaven. We will be a glorified body for life eternal. That's what it's going to be. Job said, I'll see my Redeemer in mine own eyes. That's scriptural doctrine too that I taught my son. Also, there is another thing about it. We can go in peace. I told him about his grandfather miracle, my dad. I was with him in St. Mary's Hospital when he died. And he suffered with cancer. And the reason why I use my dad as an example because my grandson knew my daddy very well and loved him. And I told him all pain and suffering my daddy went through. I was with him the minute he closed his eyes for the last time. They were bright blue and he had no pain on his face. He was at peace with himself. And he was ready to go meet his maker, his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he died in peace. Now, that's what my son, me, and all of you can expect. And who are you to think for that, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? All I can do is be the messenger and convey the message. That's all I can do. I can't do anything else. Now, they mentioned about the time, look at the clock, and they didn't tell me what time it had to be when I had to shut up. Now, I want to go over just real quick, like, I'm just going to give you an overview of this. I, I do different types of, when I have something. Uh, last time I spoke to the congregation here, I gave them an in depth study of a very short uh, uh, portion of the scripture about he left us peace. The only peace we ever have in this life is the Lord, Lord, and Savior Jesus Christ and what he brought to us. 
There is no peace in the world. There's no love in the world. There's no comfort in your heart except what He gave you. He is the one who gave you everything you got as far as peace, calm, and all the things concerning that. Now, they crucified Him. I'm, going to, I'm just going to give you a very quick scenario of this and a very short overview of this. The time that they went into the city to meet the man that had the pitcher of water and go into the building and, and establish the upper room is where they was going to eat the sacrifice. I want you to say this, and you want to go back and all four of the gospels have something to say about this. You can go read it for yourself. I'm going to give you an overview. They went, this was a time of transformation from the old law service to the times of Christ in the New Testament church. That's what this is about. And Christ taught us then. They did kill and they did eat the sacrifice. There was two, uh, what you might call suppers took place then, if you want to talk about it. You never hear any of this TV church and stuff don't mention things like this. They don't get down to the nitty gritty of the nuts and bolts of what the scriptures say. They went in, they killed a sacrifice, they eat it. And then after that, when all these things that took place, I'm just going to skip over a lot of that because you go back and you study that. All the things took place on up when they put him on the cross. There's a lot of things that happened. Took place then. What had took place? He was hung on the cross. Now, our Lord, our God, Almighty in heaven, turned his back on our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for three hours. It was total darkness for three hours. Why was that? No one, no one can take any credit for leading us out of our dead trespasses and sin except our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died on the cross. Now, they killed the sacrifice here. Now, later on, the sacrificial lamb of God was offered on the cross. Now, the moon turned to blood, as in, Joel, in, in the prophecy of Joel. And the moon turned to blood. What happened then? The old law service dealt in fables, customs, and traditions. It was changed in the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what happened. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything happened, but I'm going to tell you some of these key points, and I'm going to shut up about it. But uh, then what happens? The graves open up and the bodies come out. What bodies come out of those graves? And who were they? Did you ever study much about that? Who was he bodies come out of that grave? Christ came out first. Remember that. That's very important. He arose first. Then there's 144,000 bodies come out of that grave. This is in the 14th chapter of Revelation. If you want to go over and do some real dead in depth study of this, do that. Now, 144,000 bodies come out. These are little virgin boys, little children that would not mature yet. Where in the world did you get 144,000 bodies? Go back and read King Herod when he slew all those children when he wanted to kill Christ. When he was a baby. When he was a little boy. That's where those 144,000 people came from. It's 12,000 of each tribe of the children of Israel. Who are the children of Israel? That's not that body of land over there that's fighting about right now. That's a bunch of nonsense. That rock's what they're fighting about. It was the children that was killed then. Christ resurrected them and took him with him. He didn't send them back to the grave. They come out of the grave. He didn't put them back in the grave. He took them with him. That's 144,000 of them. Now you may disagree with me. Nobody agrees with me all the time, but that's okay. We're even. I don't agree with them all the time either. So it don't matter. But go study this in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. That's who it was. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that's pinned down with John on the island of Patmos. That's what happened. Now, anybody want to dispute that? That's fine. I don't care. When you get 85 years old, you don't worry about things. Like that. <laughs> okay? 
Now, if I didn't make any sense in what I had to say today, then you wouldn't listen. Okay? If you pay attention to what I said, Christ died for us. He led us. This is spiritually symbolic of the children of Israel. And Israel was a man. God changed his name Jacob to Israel. It's not that body of land. That was the that was what they gave them in the land of Canaan. And, and then what happened now is we got to understand these things that he gave us. The Bible is our way of understanding what Christ did for us. It all centers around that one thing. They crucified him. That's, that, that's what happened. It doesn't matter how you put it or how they done it. But when God turned his back on Christ, it was so no one, nobody, nothing, nothing, nothing it ever existed can ever take credit for leading us out of our dead, trespassing sins except our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was crucified for us. Now I'm going to hush and turn back over to the pastor. Thank you, brother. I did remember that message you talked about. You taught me well. So now I just have to wait 24 years to get the other sermon from her week. <laughs> uh, we certainly are thankful for what's come before us uh, this morning. So many things have come to mind. Uh, several things that Brother Ricky uh, brought forth this morning was exactly where my mind has been on some things this, this weekend. Just, uh, Again, just so thankful for the opportunity to be here. We're, we're going to briefly, uh, we won't dismiss, but we're going to have a brief intermission. Uh, let everybody get prepared for the community of Fort Washington. Uh, for those that, uh, and again, Old Baptist, we probably get some flat from this somewhere along the way, but the Old Baptist, this is the way that we believe the scriptures uh, give us to do this. That uh, we, Some refer to it as a closed communion. It's not a closed communion. Uh, we're not asking anybody to leave by no chance, uh, or by, by no stretch of the imagination, but uh, we believe that the scriptures prescribe that in order to take part in the communion, you have to be baptized in the Lord of the Primitive Baptist Church in order to take part in that. Uh, if uh, that be the case, we want to welcome everyone to come back when it's ready. Once you hear the sound of singing, we'll sing a song to let everybody know that we've got everything set up and ready to go for it. Uh, but for those that are, have not, uh, made that profession of faith and walked through the water baptism, but we certainly do want to welcome you to stay and observe, uh, because I can remember uh, doing that a couple of times as a child, and it, it made a great impression on me. Uh, so, uh, again, we'll consider yourself uh, just briefly dismissed, and uh, until you hear the sound of singing, make yourself ready to take part in being the foot washing.